And this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The Trump administration failed to meet a court-imposed deadline Tuesday to reunite all children under the age of five who were separated from their parents at the border. According to the government, just 38 children out of the 102 children under the age of five have been reunited with their parents. Attorney Lee Gallant of the American Civil Liberties Union criticized the Trump administration for missing the deadline. We are extremely disappointed that the government looks like they're not going to reunify all the eligible children today and that they have not even tracked down the removed parents. But we do think since the judge became involved in the compliance process after this past Friday, things have taken a real step forward and there has been progress. We are hoping that that means from now on no deadline will be missed either for these under five or for any of the 2,000 plus going forward. Over 60 children under the age of five remain separated from their parents, as well as nearly 3,000 children over the age of five. On Tuesday, Judge Dana Sabra reiterated that all separated children must be reunited with their parents by July 26. He said, quote, these are firm deadlines. They are not aspirational goals. On Tuesday night, Secretary of Health and Human Services Alex Azar told CNN the United States was acting generously toward the migrant children. It is one of the great acts of American generosity and charity what we are doing for these unaccompanied kids who are smuggled into our country or come across illegally. Secretary Azar went on to explain the delays in reuniting the other children with their parents. We could put children back with individuals who are murderers, kidnappers, rapists, or are not their parents, but we've worked with the court to ensure that we do our duty, which is to protect child welfare and ensure that they are in fact that. I could release all of the kids by 10.55 p.m., but I don't think you want that. I know the court doesn't want that. We're joined right now by two guests. Loa McCreel is an immigration reporter for the Houston Chronicle, joining us from Houston. And Barbara Hines is an immigration lawyer and founder of the University of Texas Immigration Law Clinic. She's worked on immigration issues in Texas, including cases involving immigrant parents separated from their children, and will tell us the story of Flores, the Flores settlement. But we're going to Loa McCreel in Houston first. Loa you told the story of a woman who you witnessed in court uh, just last week or the week before, um, who was raped by two police officers. Can you repeat that story here? Sure. Um, so I was in Brownsville last week and sat in on a, a credible fear hearing in the Port Isabel Detention Center, where most of the separated parents are being held. And all of the, the women in this hearing had already had their credible fear interviews denied, which is the first step to, to getting asylum. And they were asking the judge to reconsider their claims. One of the, the women was this mother who told the judge that she had been raped by police officers in, El so in, in her, the country where she's from, in Central America, and that she was coming here to ask for asylum because they threatened to kill her and her family. She came here with four of her children, including one she was still breastfeeding. And when Border Patrol agents found her, they prosecuted the mom for coming here illegally and took away her children, placing them in foster care. And at the hearing uh, last week, she, she told the judge that she had been unable to articulate her asylum claim because she was so upset about her, this, her separated children and not knowing where they were. And she said she had yet been able to hear anything about them. Um, the judge eventually decided he sternly questioned her, but eventually told her that he was going to give her another chance to make her asylum claim. But as of last week, she still had not heard from her children. And we don't know if she's been reunited with them yet at this point. So, Lori, mean, th does that mean that the, uh, the immigration officials separated her children from her before they even conducted an interview with her? It's, uh, uh, could you explain that? And yeah, I mean, that is how the, the process seems to have worked. At, you know, Border Patrol, when they were, were doing this policy, Border Patrol agents would decide to separate the parents and the children and would prosecute the parents who would usually serve a few days in prison before going to immigration detention. 
and that's where they had the opportunity to make their asylum claim. And was there any, uh, uh, during the proceeding, was there any indication of what kind of uh, paperwork, if any, uh, ICE officials gave or, or Border Patrol gave to the mother about where the children were being sent? That didn't come up in the hearing, but we know just from, from other parents I've spoken to, they sometimes were just told their children were going to Texas or to Florida, and sometimes they were given a 1-800 number for uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is in charge of these immigrant children. But they complained that the 1-800 number didn't—they couldn't always get through on it, or that the, the agency often required a number to call back, which parents in detention often didn't have. So it was really difficult for them to find out the whereabouts of their children. Speaking to CNN Tuesday evening, Secretary of Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said 38 children have been reunited and explained the delays in reuniting the other children with their parents. The remaining ones are children whose parents didn't confirm to be parents. They were lying about being parents. They're demonstrably unfit. We've got one alleged to be a murderer, one who's a kidnapper, one rapist, one who's a trafficker, one alleged by the child to be a child abuser. We've got another 23 who are unavailable because they're in marshal's service custody or jails or have been deported. And then, finally, another 25 where we have not yet completed the parent checks or the criminal background checks um, or the they have been released into the interior of the country. And we continue to work very collaboratively with the court on all of these. Our central mission is protecting child welfare while still reuniting families. Brownsville Mayor Tony Martinez uh, was also on CNN. He refuted Azar's claims in an interview with Aaron Burnett. That's not the information I got. And I, I basically went straight to the, 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 the coordinator of the entire Southwest Keys. And according to the information I got, and like I said, I've been there, uh, they claim to be able to have all the information necessary and ready to go. Um, and but for whatever reason, it becomes somewhat out of their control as to how they go from here on out. So um, I, there may be a miscommunication somewhere, but I, I felt like I got a good answer from uh, the executive director of Southwest Keys and saying, we're ready to go and ready to move on. But uh, they, they just, they're just waiting there in limbo. That's Brownsville Mayor Tony Martinez, who said that Casa Padre, the Southeast Keys facility, said they had 36 kids ready to go, but the government wouldn't move on them. Barbara Hines, you're the head of the University of Texas Immigration Law Clinic. Um, can you respond to Azar saying um, this remarkable quote um, uh, that it was an act of American generosity that they took the children from the parents. And then Trump following up yesterday as he was leaving for the NATO summit, saying uh, that these people shouldn't come in to have come into this country at all. Well, I find that statement incredible. There was no concern for the welfare of children. No one concerned with child welfare would take young children away from their parents. Um, these are legitimate asylum seekers um, doing what I consider a really brave thing, looking for safety and refuge for their children. And the fact that they only returned, what is it, about a third, a little over a third of the children on a court-imposed deadline yesterday, um, and still have yeah. almost 3,000 to go, which must be returned within the next two weeks. Can you tell us the status of this and your colleagues throughout Texas and Arizona who are working with these nonprofits that are trying to unite parents, even parents who have been released, who are there, who are desperately waiting for their children? So, our experience has been that the um, government has imposed all sorts of um, regulations and requirements for parents to get their children back. And what I think is important is that the government had no process whatsoever to take the children away. So it's very hypocritical to now be saying you have to have a police check and you have to have this and you have to have that, when there was no process whatsoever for the parents when their children were seized. So there are many uh, women and men who have been released from uh, ICE detention who are unable to see their children. They're allowed an hour visit 
uh, if they can, where their children are detained, for example, Southwest Keys that you mentioned. And, and also, this issue that was raised over the weekend uh, by federal authorities of doing DNA testing to, to, to determine the act whether children were actually the children of people who are claiming to be their parents. Uh, do you know whether this has actually gone through or what the status of that is? I don't know. I know there's been a lot of um, debate about DNA. And once again, that's an extraordinary, unnecessary process. Um, DNA is only used when there is a significant or serious doubt about parentage. Many of the parents who have been denied um, the recovery of their children have birth certificates, and they have documents to prove that, they're, that they are the parents and that these are their children. Uh, also, what about the, the whole issue of, uh, of the parents who have already been deported? Uh, what is the administration doing in terms of them? They're just saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it now that we've deported them? Well, yes, I think they're certainly not doing what I would consider due diligence. They were responsible for deporting the parents, and they need to find these parents, and they need to reunite them with their children as quickly as possible. I think it is outrageous, the idea in our country that you would deport parents without their children, parents who arrived at the border with their children. I'd like to turn to a parent who's been separated from her child. A Honduran mother named Jessica told the BBC what happened to her when she and her six-year-old son uh, attempted to enter the United States six weeks ago. They told us, you are criminals. You will be imprisoned and your kids will be given up for adoption. They yelled at us so badly that our kids got scared. They told us to lay our kids on the floor. At midnight, they came to pick up the kids. There was a mom breastfeeding her baby, and one of the officers told her she wasn't an animal to be taking her breast out like that, and they took her baby. They cuffed her and chained her in front of the kids. What they've done is horrible. I have no information on my son. It's been more than 50 days since I last heard of him. I call and no one gives me any information. I can't even sleep. I wake up and my heart is beating so fast. I can't even breathe. They told me my son is somewhere in New York, but no one answers the phone when I call. There are so many mothers like me that have no idea where their kids are and that are still in the detention center. Never did I imagine it was going to be like this, that they would take our kids. Our kids have no fault for the mistakes the adults make. That's Jessica talking to the BBC about what happened when she and her six-year-old son attempted to enter the United States. Um, if you could tell me, Lomi Creel, how typical is this story? And are you seeing these stories increase or decrease right now? Um, I mean, I think from what I know, just from having talked to parents and lawyers, that story is, is pretty typical. I mean, that's what happened with parents who came with their children. Sometimes their children were, were taken away and they were told about it, or sometimes they would there were some cases where parents reported they went to the bathroom, um, and when they came back, their children were gone. So, and also, it's been very difficult, as, as she said, to for the parents to find out where their children are. Um, these stories, though, are, are not increasing. The administration has stopped, essentially, prosecuting parents who come with their children. So we're not seeing more separations. The question now is just reunifying all of these children with their parents. Well, uh, on Monday, federal judge Dolly G in Los Angeles dealt a major blow to the Trump administration's efforts to indefinitely jail migrant families, including asylum seekers. She ruled the Trump administration cannot amend the 1997 Flores Agreement, which says children cannot be jailed for more than 20 days. 
Uh, Barbara Hines, could you talk about the Flores, uh, uh, the Flores uh, uh, agreement, what it is uh, and how it initially developed, and also the problems that occurred with it under the Obama administration, uh, as well now as w with the Trump administration? Um, yes. The Flores uh, settlement came out of litigation over the treatment of children in the 1980s into the 1990s. And it is a settlement that's been in effect since 1997, and it governs the treatment of children uh, if they're detained. But the most important thing in Flores is that the presumption is that children should not be detained, um, that they should be released as promptly as possible, generally within five days, if there's no uh, facility in the area, if there is, in 72 hours. Um, and that they should be reunited outside the community as quickly as possible. And the Obama administration violated the Flores Agreement, trying to keep parents and children detained for long periods of time, arguing the Flores uh, settlement, uh, just like the Trump administration, does not include accompanied children, that is, children that appear with their parents, that present themselves at the border with their parents. And Judge G now twice has resoundedly rejected both the um, arguments of the Obama administration and, once again, of the Trump administration, and has rejected the notion that children and their parents can be prolonged, indefinitely detained as uh, Trump is now um, claiming that he needs to do, or what he wants to do. Who was Flores? Uh, Jenny Flores was a Salvadorian um, who was detained um, in the late 80s, um, the last time there were large numbers of Central Americans coming to this country. And so the Trump administration says, I mean, they continue to defy deadlines. Um, they say they did this. It was a humanitarian act, uh, separating children from murderers and rapists. Um, uh, and now they say they will hold them together, want to hold them indefinitely, perhaps on military bases and other places. So what happens next? Can the Flores settlement withstand the challenge? Well, I think the Flores uh, settlement can withstand the challenge. The Flores settlement is the law. It's an agreement that the government um, entered into and has abided by for many years, um, although, as I said, the Obama administration tried to get out of the um, settlement as well. But basically, Judge G said that what Trump is proposing is not possible under the settlement, and it's not possible under the order of um, the San Diego judge. So basically, uh, I don't think that Trump is going to be able to hold families indefinitely. What's important, as well, is that in his ex executive order and his pronouncements, he ignores the liberty interest, the Constitution and our immigration statutes, which uh, provide for all immigrants the right to present an application for release from detention. We just have 15 seconds, but um, what about people who come over the border, who don't speak Spanish, even? The uh, Trump administration says the border guards speak Spanish, but indigenous languages, Barbara Hines. That's a, that's a very significant problem. Um, uh, colleagues of mine um, met with families at the Hutto Detention Center near um, Austin. And they could not communicate with the indigenous speakers there. They were even more isolated than the Spanish speakers. They had no idea of what was happening with their children. There are not enough interpreters for indigenous, primarily Guatemalan uh, languages. Even before this humanitarian crisis, the phone lines don't work in detention centers. There are not enough interpreters. So this is really one of the most isolated populations, and the idea that the administration would then take their children um, and not be able to communicate with them is, um, I think, illegal and certainly um, immoral. Barbara Hines, we want to thank you for being with us, University of Texas Immigration Law Clinic. And Loy McCreel of The Houston Chronicle will link to your pieces at democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. When we come back, President Trump threatened to bomb Venezuela? We'll talk uh, with um, Mark Weisbrot about Venezuela, the major protests that are taking place in Haiti, and also about what's happening in Brazil and Mexico. Stay with us.